Welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and I am very excited to get today's show started. We are having our monthly check-in uh, with ACEC Colorado. That's the American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado, of which my guests today are members of ACEC Colorado, um, but also you work for your own firms, engineering firms. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have with me Tom Day and John George. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you? Thank you. Excellent. Thank Doing you. Well. Yes, wonderful. Well, Tom, I'm going to start over here with you, and uh, let's talk about your background, how long you've been in engineering, and how you ended up at Lamp Rainierson. That's correct. Awesome. Yeah. I forgot to ask about that before we got started here. Uh, yeah, so Lamp Rainierson, how long you've been there, what your background is. Okay, so I started actually working in water when I was in high school. Um, we worked on some water supply wells in Commerce City, a buddy of mine and I. Uh, mowed lawns and ended up working on some wells. I went to college in New Mexico at New Mexico School of Mining and Technology and I received a degree, Bachelor of Science in Geological Engineering. And then I went to work for Lane Western, which is a large water well and pump company. And I did that for 15 years out of college. And then the opportunity came to purchase into a company, TZA Water Engineers. So I did that in 2001, uh, worked there for I guess about 13 years, and then we merged with a company, Lamp Rynearson, in 2014. And I've been a senior project manager at Lamp Rynearson now since 2014. Awesome. So how has that experience been for you? You know, it's been really good. It's, it's my experience both as a, as a contractor turned engineer has been interesting, and, and I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to do both. Yes, I would imagine that they play an equal role in uh, shaping your career now. They definitely have, yes. Yeah, absolutely. John, welcome. Yes, um, thank you. Bishop Brogdon Associates, Inc. Yes. Yes, awesome. Okay, that one, that one I did know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, how long have you been with them? What's your background like? Uh, so I grew up in Wyoming. I uh, have relatives that homesteaded in Colorado, though. Uh, so coming back to Colorado was not a complete foreign thing to me. Uh, got a, a civil engineering degree at University of Wyoming, uh, came down here in 2004, and had done an internship actually at Bishop Brogdon, um, got a job working at TZA, <laughs> <laughs> and, and a few years later jumped ship and uh, started at Bishop Brogdon, um, water resources engineering the whole time, um, have been a part owner at, at Bishop Brogdon, or BBA is what we call it for short. Uh, for about four and a half years now. Awesome. And so total about 15 years in the water resources engineering community, so to speak. Um, I call it a community instead of a job because there are, I mean, we are a community of kind of a niche group that work on water rights and Colorado water issues and Western water issues. Oh, I like that. Um, you mentioned off air as we were talking here that uh, not only do you guys cross paths clearly at another firm, mm -hmm. um, but you're you're golfing buddies, right? Well, actually, we're fishing buddies. Fishing, fishing. buddies. Fishing. That's what it was. <laughs> yes, one of those sports I clearly take part in a lot. <laughs> and water sports, and snow sports, and we just enjoy each other's company. Yep. Oh, nice. Well, good. Yeah. That's good to hear. So, luckily, I have you both in here to talk with me about the economic and environmental impacts of water. Um, and that seems like it might be a boring subject, but uh, from what I've been reading all day, uh, it is not. Colorado water rights are insane to say the least and anytime you have any structure that's being built you have to get in touch with water rights yes so. that's true yeah very much so and uh, maybe just a, a little background on water rights in general in colorado colorado uh were under the prior appropriation system so first in time first in right so yeah. when you were here first and you just developed that water first you're the first in right to get that water just because the next guy is either upstream or downstream of you doesn't mean he gets to take water before you. you you're the first guy to get it. You always will get it. Okay. And so there are many times during the year, um, except for maybe in the spring runoff when there's lots of water coming down the river, that there's a call on and some people are not getting water. Okay. And so that's an important note of just, even though it looks like there's water in the river, Pretty much all of it's spoken for, and maybe sometimes multiple times as you go down the river mm -hmm. uh, that people have calls on and then all the flow in the river disappears. It goes into a ditch or a pipe or whatever, and uh, it may happen two or three times before the, the river leaves the state. 
All right, so I I have so many questions that can go into that, um, but let's start, let's start off. And I do appreciate that background. Uh, we'll talk about the history of CBT, the water market indicator. Um, I, I think that's a good basis to yes. to start mm -hmm. with, right? Uh, so that we can get a little small understanding on that. Uh, so Tom, if you want to dive in on CBT and yeah. the market indicator prices, what that means for us. So the CBT is the Colorado Big Thompson project. Um, I'm not sure when it started. I think it was back in the 30s. Um, it's a project that was, it's a federal project that was designed to bring water over initially for irrigation, you know, for a, on, the, on, the west, on the eastern slope. Um, it brings water from the western slope to the eastern slope. And in 1959, um, the value of a CBT share was like a dollar. Uh, we have graphical representation of how that has changed over time. Uh, it's actually up to thirty thirty to thirty eight thousand dollars per share currently. Okay, I'm gonna stop you real quick because we went from a dollar to thirty thousand um, dollars, which isn't unheard of from the fifties for anything really. Um, but that being said, how are we measuring? What are these units? What does that mean? So the CBT units are measured in acre feet. Okay. So. It's acre feet that come into the system, and there's there's numerous, I guess, there's different units that you can have, but let's just say it's one acre foot. I think it's 0.7. Is that correct, John? 0. The 7. average yield of a CBT share. Yeah, the average yield of a CBT share is 0. 0.7 acre feet. Um, and it's water that is brought over from the west slope to the east slope through the uh, Moffat Tunnel, the Granby uh, plant, yeah. um, and other diversions. Um, Lake Granby, Horsetooth Reservoir, Shadow Mountain, Boulder Reservoir, and Carter Lake are all part of the system. Okay. Um, so let me ask you this then. Pertaining to Colorado, one of the big things that I hear all the time is how California is stealing our water. How does that work? Is that Am I crazy for saying that? How is that working? Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's getting into some interstate compact issues. Okay. Um, so there's the Colorado River Compact that has the upper basin states of which Colorado is one. Um, the biggest producer of water in the state of Colorado is the Colorado River Basin. That's the by far the largest amount of water that leaves our state. We're one of the very few basins that we're a headwater state. All of the water that... Uh, 99 point something percent of the water that's in the state of Colorado originated in the state of the Colorado and eventually flows out of Colorado. Right. There's not many states that are like that in this country. Yeah. Uh, so the upper basin states, so the nuts and bolts of an interstate compact is these states say, we'll do this with our water. And these other states that rely on that water that are downstream say, hey, we're going to do this with our water. And there's volumes of acre feet, uh, volumes of water in acre feet typically that are identified. So some basins, and Tom, do you remember the numbers? It's seven and a half million acre feet that has to pass Lee's Ferry. That's um, correct. Okay. Down to from the upper basin states to the lower basin states on a running average. Okay. Historically, so far, the upper basin states haven't used all that water. And so the lower basin states have been taking it. And they've continued to take it and become reliant upon it. Okay. And so now when it becomes, say, a drought period or just a period of less stream flow mm -hmm. now we're starting to go hey we're getting close to not providing that seven and a half million acre feet what happens right and that's that's become a, a bigger and bigger issue as as this kind of drought that started in the early 2000s and we've had good water years but we've had a lot of not such good water years drought years right um that oh, are yeah. really causing those uh, lake mead and lake powell water levels to go down all right and, so, oh. I, and and I think it, you know it's a co it's a combination factor it's the supply isn't changing or in drought years it is it's going down mm -hmm. but the demand is increasing every year year over year over year so yeah. we're going to reach a, a critical point do we do we have a timeline on that critical point uh, I would tell you that if we run into a multi year drought okay. um, we will have problems okay. So the cyclone bomb that we just had, yes. uh, you know, last week or so, um, I would imagine that's only helpful in the long run for the water rights. Or am, am I way off base with that, too? Uh, helpful for this year, yes. I would say, right. yes. This okay. year, I mean, the the cyclone bomb, I mean, I, I did a quick <laughs> check. At the beginning of March, we were at 110% of our snowpack Okay. Uh, for the year, kind of at, at that time. 
Now at our time, at time now, on the, via the 14th of March, we're at 143 percent of snowpack. So okay. our percentage above average or median is is climbing because of this recent snow that we've gotten. All right, but it and will have zero impact really in 2020. Well, so that you got to remember the snow all yeah. melts, and yeah. if we don't either have the ability to use it or mm -hmm. capture and store it, it flows out of the state. Okay. So right. it's not that you get to say we had this water and we're going to take what we had last year next year. Okay. Yeah, it's not like a bank account where you get to put money in year after year after year and take some out whenever you need it. It's it's kind of a, a little bit of use it or lose it. You can't capture it in some accounts in mm -hmm. the buckets, um, the storage reservoirs that are out there, but they're only so big. Yeah. Um, and, and another example I just wanted to point it out, for March, right now we're only at 83% of our average storage okay. capacity in the state last year this time 2018 when we had a drought we were at 115 percent of average so we went into a drought way above average mm -hmm. now we w had a whole year of kind of drought conditions that storage got pulled way down and so now we're we're trying to refill it but we're still not even to where we are on average typically as far as storage okay and so that's know. so we got a lot of snowpack, but we don't have a lot of storage. So a lot of that water will get socked away. Okay, which will help us in the future. Help, and us, may help us maybe in 2020, right. but it may not last to 2022. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm following you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so I, I want to talk about some trends in the marketplace as far as the cost of water mm -hmm. goes. Um, local water brokers say that the development and a shift in demographics of who owns CB2 units have caused a decrease in market activity. Um, so who owns that, and, and are we going to see a shift back up? So CBTs, you know, when it when initiated, it was primarily agricultural users, but there were cities along the front range that owned it. So roughly when the project started, it was approximately 80% used for uh, agricultural purposes and 20% for municipal water supplies. And currently, it's almost a reverse shift. So currently, only 20% of it is being used for agricultural purposes, and 80% is, is going to municipal supplies. Okay. All right. Um, and so because of that shift, um, we, we saw a little bit of a decrease, right, in the market value. Not recently. Not, not, recent. not recently. Okay, so this was a while ago. <laughs> it, the CBT goes up and down over it, throughout history of just kind of what's going on. And, and maybe you saw a decrease um, during the recession. I'm just looking at 2017. Yeah, yeah. There was a decrease between 19 or between 2000. And two, which was a drought year, and 2010, roughly. Okay. Since 2010, uh, it's gone up for from approximately seven to eight thousand dollars a share in 2010 to above thirty thousand dollars a share this year. Okay, so are we going to continue to see that increasing, which is not good, right? We want that price to be a little bit lower. Right. Okay. Yeah. It, it, CBT is a kind of a, a special thing, and especially in northern Colorado, because it 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 acts a little differently than water throughout the state, just because it, it's a very specific type of water okay. that has very specific attributes to it that make it very susceptible to changes in, say, development. And, you know, the cities up there have become reliant upon it. OK. And that's and, and for some cases, that's the only type of water a city can t use. Yeah. Um, they don't have lots of other different water supplies. Okay. And so if you're wanting to build houses, develop, et cetera, uh, that's what you have to go out and find. And because all the cities have 80% of it now, you know, the, the marketplace for people willing to sell it is, is shrinking and shrinking every day. Right. right. And, and I would just say, you know, it's bad to have the price go up. And I, I think that that comment could be a general comment unless you bought it in 2010 for 8,000 a share and now it's worth over 30 they probably would like it see to see it climb to 50 so. fair enough <laughs> right like housing market Correct. you know mm -hmm. as a, as someone who wants to buy this is not an ideal market all right, right. so same as it goes with water then right and then yeah. just briefly we should touch on you know that's just pretty much the northern part of the state right so then you know other northern water supplies that are used are south platte river water arkansas river water um, and then there's the denver basin groundwater supplies um, 
which are those are all supplies that other municipalities and or uh, private water consult private water um, owners utilize in their portfolio and some have multiple or all of them yeah and i should say for the colorado front range okay you know, that's yes. you know the folks in grand junction are not relying on south platte they're they're relying on Colorado so River this, water. But for the bulk of us in the front range, that's what you're relying on. Okay. That is good to know. So that's going to impact you deciding on where you build. It has a big impact on deciding on where you build and uh, and and your viability to build. Uh, a lot of developers that come from out of state and decide they're going to build here, uh, they get lost in the weeds. So hopefully they end up hiring a good water engineering firm and a good water attorney to help them through the process. Okay. Well, and I wanted to, I want to weave back into that um, because I so the water rights in Colorado, it's statewide rights. But I'm sure that there's some tenants there when you go into different municipalities. Right? Yeah, there. The, I, I would say there's a, a wide variety, a range of what municipalities will even accept as water rights. Okay. Um, so some municipalities, like I said earlier, only accept CBT water because that's the only way they get, they, they have the infrastructure set up to, to take CBT water, to treat it into potable water and deliver it out to their customers. Um, other cities may have three or four different supplies of water. Um, it just depends on that city, their system and where they're f geographically located in the state. Okay. Right. And, and just. Briefly, one of the more interesting projects that's been done recently is the city of Aurora uh, built the Prairie Waters Project, which the city of Aurora owns water rights, and a portion of those water rights are reusable. So once they're used once, they go through the wastewater treatment plant, and they get discharged into the South Platte River. Uh, the city of Aurora built a facility up near Brighton or near Fort Lepton, Colorado, where they actually capture those return flows and pump them back to the Aurora Reservoir, treat them, and they become part of the system again. So I think as, as time marches forward, John and I are seeing more and more innovative approaches to reuse of water and recapture and um, put that water to multiple beneficial uses, not just one. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, it's inevitable that we're going to need to find all of the technologies to be able to reuse all the things, um, right. which is great to know that you see it and that you continue to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to I wanna get down here to what it costs to get a tap. So in a new build, I'm building a home. Mm -hmm. What's the average cost that I'm looking <laughs> at there? Is that a loaded question? Uh, a, a bit of a loaded question because, uh, uh, again, it depends on where you are. Right. And how, like, if you're building a house – Let's say out in the countryside and you have 35 acres or more and you can just go out and drill a well. Okay. And that well, dep again, depending you on where you just, are. You say just, but there's a whole lot. There's, there's a whole lot that. into that. <laughs> you could drill a well and it you can have a well that's 20 feet deep and needs very little treatment to it. You got a water supply for that house. You could live in some of the areas in the northern front range of Colorado. I've heard prices going for as much as $50,000 just to have basically connect up to a water supply. That's the raw water and the treatment and the, you know, getting the pipes to the house just to get a pipeline of water going to your house. And that's not even including a, perhaps I need it more purified, right? Uh, the, that would be a, a potable water supply from okay, a be. municipality. Okay. Um, so that would, but, but still $50,000 for when your house, say medium house price is 350,000 or $300,000 up there. That's a significant portion of your house value. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, so how is water measured? <laughs> how do you water, want to measure it? It depends on how you want to measure it. You know, we previously talked about acre feet, and that's a volume of water. So it's so, so that'd be like a gallon. That is one gallon. Well, no, uh, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. an acre foot of water is lots and lots of gallons, such okay. that an acre foot would be filling up one acre of land. Okay. A foot deep of water with water, so that's like a football field, one foot deep of water. There's three hundred and fifty thousand gallons in one acre foot that's a lot of water that's, yeah. it's a lot to wrap my head yep. around well right. one, about one house if you have a house they will consume about a half an acre foot of water per year 
I feel like that's a lot of water. And so that's, well, that's indoor uses. That's your, I you know, mean, showering. Yeah. Irrigation. Uh, but that's also watering your grass in the summertime. Yeah. You know, so your average house uses about half of the water inside, half of the water out on the grass. Yeah. And they consume about a half an acre foot a year. Wow. So about right. And so yeah. in Colorado, the other thing is, if you think about that, half is inside and half is outside, your demand in the winter is is less than half of your peak demand, which is in the summer. Okay. All right. That plays a significant role. Mm -hmm. So uh, so these measurements obviously affect the price of water. The, the actual measurements don't, you know, and then we okay. measure it in cubic feet per second, acre feet, gallons per minute, million gallons per day. It depends on really the industrial or municipal um, entity on how they, how they're going to measure it right or, so, or discipline that you know a lot of the treatment you know either water treatment for potable supply or wastewater treatment they like to talk in million gallons a day okay that's that's right. their magic rate that they design <laughs> things to and you you see a here's a water treatment plant it'll treat three million gallons a day okay other places, it's like, no, 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 we want CFS, so that's a flow. That's cubic feet per second. Okay. So that's kind of like how much water's flying out of your garden hose or how much water's f going through a pipe. Okay, so the flow. That's the flow. The that's there. the flow okay. rate. And the rafters, like John, they like to measure right. it in flow cubic rate. feet per <laughs> second because they want enough, enough water to raft the river. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, yeah, rafting is, is yeah, a good so time. Yeah, so most of the rivers in the state, if you're looking at the, there's a huge network of stream gauges that track how much water is flowing through all the rivers in the state. Uh, they're all reporting in CFS. You know? oh, okay. So it's, it's 200 CFS, you know. Just below uh, Denver here, you know, you're looking at two, three hundred CFS is kind of an average base flow on the river. The the Colorado River, when it's leaving the state, you know, that's anywhere from two thousand CFS all the way up to forty thousand CFS. Wow. Right. De depending on you know stream run, you know spring runoff versus kind of late season, it's real dry. Yeah. That type of thing. But. Amazing. So I, I, we have a couple minutes left in this segment, and I, I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation. I, I feel like you guys are like, really, this is what you're asking me? But I'm fascinated. No, we're, no it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> this is great. Um, I'm, well, good. I'm glad because I, this is this is really hard to wrap your head around, and unless you're somebody that's in the field that works it, um, it's it's not really second nature to understand water usage and uh, you know how water gets to your house, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, in this last minute here, I want to ask you, um, these, these measurements of how we're measuring, um, that can impact a business when I, I want to build an office building in Denver. Yes. All right. So I'm going to use a certain measurement of water for that project. Okay. What would that be? <laughs> so that would be, that would be in, um, gallons okay. and it would, what would happen is, is depending on how many taps you have, so you have three showers and, you know, five toilets, then you have to have a certain tap size coming from Denver. Okay. If you change that to four showers, there's a break point when you change it and your tap size changes from three quarters of an inch to an inch and your tap fees increase substantially. So sometimes people weigh that in and sometimes don't. I have a good friend who's just building a gym and he did not weigh it in. And so... He has to put in a new tap because he has one additional shower. Okay. I appreciate that. We're going to take a quick break here on Connect and Collaborate. Stay with us. Be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page while you're here. Find this podcast and more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Connect and Collaborate. Once again, I'm Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and we are having our monthly show with American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado, and that is acec-co.org if you want to learn more information. Um, we'll get to, we'll get into some more entities and how you guys are tied in with that a little bit later. Um, but once again, in studio with me, Tom Day with Lamp Rynearson and John George with Bishop Brogdon Associates, Inc., BBA. Water. BBA for short, yep. Yeah. Um, so we are having a, a, an awesome conversation, quite honestly. I'm thoroughly enjoying myself, and I... I uh, did some research on water rights in Colorado, but I clearly was not enough time uh, to look at that because they are very convoluted. 
Um, but we mentioned a little bit in the last segment, you touched on this, uh, John, about uh, wells mm -hmm. in Colorado, right? So if I want to build an entity out in the country, my best bet is probably to build a well rather than trying to get some water rights on streams. Yeah, and there's the, a well can have a water right too. Okay. Uh, so there's there's not just uh, if you're a, a small like if you're just one house or two houses out on a large parcel of land, you can get a well permit. You don't have to get water rights, um, and the and the state engineer will administer that as a as an exempt well uh, that you can pump what, 15 gallons a minute, and you yep. can't have more than three structures. Okay. And you can pump one acre foot per year. Yeah. Okay. So one acre foot. So we typically use about half an acre foot per year. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yay. Yeah. Okay. I'm yep. getting there, guys. I'm getting there. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about the difference between private source and public source when it comes to wells okay. and water. Yeah. Sure. So generally, the the in within the state of Colorado, 15% uh, of households are on a private source, and, and the majority of those are private wells. 85% um, are on some sort of a municipal or private water system. So that water, uh, if you're on a, a private system, you have a well, There's you don't have to test it. Uh, you can get your water tested for, you know, lead and copper is the big one now since the Flint, Flint Michigan thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you can have it tested, and there's a number of different companies, Culligan, um, you know, other treatment firms that can treat water and make it potable for your indoor use. If it's a public water system, then they are regulated by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and you have to have a public water system identification number. And so as that, you your water is tested in accordance with the state rules and regulations, and you have to have a licensed water system operator basically to say that the water's being delivered is potable to the customers. Okay. All right. So, all right. I'm with you on that. You have to, you just have to have someone confirm it. Confirm it and do constant testing. Yeah. It, it, How often is that it. testing? So it depends on the test, but like monthly you have to do coliform tests to make sure that there's no E. coli in the water. Um, and on an annual basis, you have to do other tests for like fluoride. Um, depending on what your results of your initial water source are, then the state outlines and they have a monitoring plan. And so you have to test your water based on the state monitoring plan. So that's a yearly monitoring plan. Okay. And everybody that's on a public water system, uh, you can get the results of your public water system through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, they put out an, you should get an annual consumer confidence report. And it basically tells you what's in your water and when it was tested and if there's any issues. Okay. All right. I enjoy yep. hearing that. Well, let me ask you this, and I don't know that either one of you would be able to answer because I'm sure there's eight ways we can go with this, but if I were to build a house and do my own well and do this private source, am I actually saving myself money in the long run doing that, or would it be better for me to do the public because I have to do the testing? Again, it, it depends I, on where I, you are. I, exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean, there may not be a public source. Okay. Um you know, if if you're up in the mountains and, you know, it's a more of a remote area anywhere, it doesn't even have to be the mountains, it can be the plains, but uh, remote areas, there just isn't a public water supply available. Okay. Um, if you start to get groups of people together where they're, you know, maybe it's, you know, 10, 15 homes starting to, you know, be together and there's, you know, maybe it's difficulties in getting a water supply. Maybe you have to, you know, drill a well, but it's a thousand feet deep or something right. like that. You may start to join up and you'll make your own little water district that gets you into being a, a water, public water provider. Correct. And, you know, it's not a one size fits all question. Right. The, the state engineer's office um, is an engine. It's the state of Colorado engineer's office, but the Department of Water Resources is a branch of that. And they're an excellent source to start with. Um, they're downtown on 1313 Sherman Street. And you can call, you can go down there, and you can get your questions answered. Or get on you their can, website. Yeah, the website's actually a really good website. So Yeah, user-friendly. Yep. Thank you. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch here a little bit. And we talked a little bit about the um, bomb cyclone, cyclone bomb, whatever you want to call it, uh, that happened. But we also had uh, flooding in 2013 here. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I'm thinking, you know, flooding, obviously lots of water, but that's not right at all. Is that right? It could be more, it could 
be more detrimental than helpful. Yeah, you know, most definitely. The The flooding in 2013, it was um, more water than some areas have ever seen in, say, a 24-hour period. Yeah. Except for after that 24-hour period, it's all gone. So it's it's running down the creek. Okay. And it, it went from, you know, normal amount of water, a whole bunch of water, and then it went right back to a normal amount of water. So And in the process of leaving the state, it caused a lot of damage. Right, the power of water is, is phenomenal. And I mean, right now what's going on in Nebraska with the flooding around Omaha and uh, Fremont, again, you see the power of water and the damage that it can cause. So water can be great environmentally for recreation and habitat, but it can also be devastating. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a natural entity and there's both sides to every coin when you're talking natural uh, disasters such as flooding and things right. like that. Um, so how, how do we look at mitigating these problems when it comes to water engineering specifically? Obviously, levees are in place in New Orleans now because of Katrina and things like that, and you're constantly improving. Um, but what is your stance? Each I'll ask each of you that on how you uh, you or your firm go in and mitigate these these negative impacts that are caused. Yeah, and it, it, my firm being a, a kind of we're a, a specialty. We we're more on the water right side. We're okay. water supply planning. Um, and protection of water rights. So we, we don't necessarily design things, but we do have to, to work with our clients that have, you know, impacts of the flooding and, you know, a, a ditch, a head gate gets washed out. Well, that ditch was their water, one of their water supplies. And so now we're working with them to, okay, you need to, you know, get that fixed. And so that is another water resources engineering company that mm -hmm. does the more civil design aspects right. of it. But then it's also, well, we also need to make sure that if that happens again, what are the backups to it? And so that's the water supply planning that we do and helping them diversify their portfolio of water rights. Okay. Right, and our firm was primarily a water rights uh, firm. I started, when I started there, we really began to do a lot of water well work. And then when we merged with Lamprey Nearson in 2014, we actually have the structural and the, and the water resources uh, arm and water wastewater. So we do work on the on the damages and the interesting one that we worked on was a uh, culver lateral ditch which is uh, outside of berthet colorado in 2013 the scouring that happened basically took the river out and it deposited and filled the ditch full of sand um, so they immediately the president of that of that ditch company also is a river morphologist so he knows how rivers act so we got a call from a contractor and we did a design build collaboration to repair the ditch, but also to to streamline the channel of that river using large boulders and diversion structure. And the goal was before the flooding, um, sand would move when the river was flowing 10 cubic feet per second. Okay. But below 10 cubic feet per second, there was no sand. So after the flooding, it, it had basically ripped all the vegetation out after the flooding, instead of sand moving at 10 CFS, sand was moving at 1 CFS. So the, the sand moving in the river was really high. Um, and so we modified the structure so that we could take the water out into the ditch that we repaired, but not take the sand, pass the sand. Okay. And then as a result of that project that was done in 2013 and early 2014, um, we're working on two more projects now that were rehabilitated in 2014, but they were still taking on huge amounts of sediment in the ditch. So now we're working on those to help streamline the river and to put structure within the river to balance both the river health and allow the irrigation companies to get their and, and irrigation and uh, industrial water through the ditch. Okay. I like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I do want to talk about more projects that you're both working on. But before we do that, I, I want to do, we did a little bit of an overview of the water rights in Colorado and who's impacted by that. Um, but one of the interesting things that I found in my uh, research here is that there's a water referee. And I've mentioned that four times to you guys. I know that I keep <laughs> mentioning it. Uh, but I found it fascinating that there's... Um, a ton of people surrounding this work in water rights in Colorado. And uh, I mean, there's a water judge if things go south. So mm -hmm. let's let's talk about water rights in Colorado as far as the overall big picture structure wise. Oh, boy. 
<laughs> uh, like I said before, it was uh, you get your water rights, and it's it's based on the prior appropriation system, so first in right, first in time. And they have basically they do water adjudications. You go out and adjudicate a water right, and so that's it's a it's a court process. Yes. So all of Colorado, um, you know, way back when decided we're going to do this via the court system so that people can come in and announce what they're going to do with their water, how we're going to use it, where we're going to use it, et cetera, how much of it they're going to use. And everybody can access that information. And that's part of what the state engineer does is provides that information. But to this day, you can still go out and adjudicate a water right. You still have to prove up where I'm going to take it, how much I'm going to use, where I'm going to use it, and the process, you know, how I'm going to use it. Am I going to use it for irrigation? Am I going to use it for a domestic water supply? Am I going to use it to cool a power plant? Okay. Um, and, and so you can go out and adjudicate a water, and that you basically file a water court application. So it's just, it's a court document. Yeah. It says, here's what I'm going to do with the water. You get people that say, hey, you know, that's just right upstream for me. Yeah, I'm going to keep an I'm going to object to that because I don't think you really need 20 CFS. I you all, I think you only need 2 CFS. Well, and there's there's one interesting so there's... part cuz how do other people know about that? Well, mm -hmm. it has to be published, which That's is something right. I don't think that I realized and I, I I don't again, not a legal person either. Um but I don't know of many uh, courts that you have to fi like publicize what you're doing mm -hmm. in a court system, right? That's that's new to me. Yeah, so you have to yeah, go there, ahead. There's a water resume that comes out, and so the water attorneys are all watching the resume, and the people that might be impacted are watching the resume. So um, if if you might be impacted, you at least want to object. Now, objecting doesn't mean you're going to fight tooth and nail to the end. It means you want to see the engineering behind their plan, okay. and if the engineering shows out that it, you're not going to be injured, then then you can settle out of the case. Or you might go back and forth. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the work we do is there, it started out on the water court track, and then the attorneys and the engineers go back and forth and back and forth with their clients, and most of it is settled before it gets to water court. Okay. Yeah, so there's kind of, it, it's a court process, but, you know, similar to, a, you know, other types of domestic court or, you know, other litigation, you, you kind of present the facts. In, in water court, it's it's maybe a more drawn out process where there's, you know, the application is filed and then you have 60 days, 90 days so to, to object, object to it. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, now we know who's, up, you know, you know, concerned about this. The state engineer also weighs in. They have a you know summary of consultation that they say, hey, here are you know concerns potentially with this water court application, and then you produce an engineering report and a proposed decree that kind of describe here's all the engineering, the details behind it, how much water, where, how, when, who, um, and then a decree, a, a document that that basically lays it out in the legal terms of all those details of here's how what we're going to do with our water. And then people can come in and say, well, we don't think you did your engineering right or your assumptions are wrong. And, and they'll go back and forth. And a lot of times they'll settle out, settle to a number. Okay. Or a, a, a term and condition that says, I'll do this if. Okay. Or when. Correct. Um, it happens, but it's not real often that they, you know, they don't see eye to eye. And you end up, um, you know, in the past, if, if you're pretty quick with it, it'll be in front of the referee. Okay. And so that's if there's not a lot of fighting. You know, you can get things done fairly quickly, and the referee will say, okay, you're, you're in agreement, you're in agreement. Okay, let's stamp this one as done. It then just goes to the water judge to kind of get a last review and approval. Okay. It may, if it takes longer than that, it goes from the referee up to the judge's docket and then may go to trial. And there may be two days of testimony where each side, each engineer, you know, that we're expert witnesses in trial. Okay. Or, two, on. or there may be two months of testimony. Or there may be two months. It it really varies. Yeah. Um, but then in the end, it's the judge that decides, you know, this is what I heard, this is what I think is right, and now you guys get to live with that. <laughs> so uh, the judge can decide for one side or for the other, or he can split the baby. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, more often than not, I, I, in your experiences, have you had to testify, either of you? I have not had to testify yet in I water court. Ha I haven't testified in water court. I've testified in civil court, and we've both been deposed, though. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we've both been deposed in preparation of going to water court. Interesting. Yeah. 
that must be kind of fun. Were, were you excited to meet meet the water judge? <laughs> well, it, when you're deposed, you're not actually in front of the water I, judge itself, yeah. but it's <laughs> so. So my boss, who's just retired, told me something, and and this is something I think is valuable in anything that you do, and that is, um, I have to I have to think for just a second, but credibility is the key to success. Confidence is the confidence is the key to credibility, and preparation is the key to confidence. So I think those are very important for, for any engineer. Yeah. And um, then we work with water attorneys who, I mean, they are bolstering a legal position and we're bolstering the engineering position. Okay. Um, it's a team. So it, it can be fun, but it's, it's high stress. I would imagine there's some definite stress yeah. going into that. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know that the state engineer is the water engineer, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, which was, again, fascinating to me. But if you're going to have such convoluted <laughs> water rights, your state engineer should probably have some background in water. Well, and, and I don't know, convoluted, I, 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 I think John and I will disagree with you on that term. Okay. Complex, yeah. complex definitely. Complex. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, okay. But if you, once you dig into it, it's a system that really makes sense, and okay. it, it's a system that works very well. Right. Yeah, it's a system that works very well for Colorado and the, the western United States where water is a, a scarce commodity at times. Awesome. Well, see, that's good to know. You've changed my perspective on that. Not so much convoluted <laughs> as it is complex. Um, so let's let's talk about, we'll switch gears one more time here for the last little bit of the segment. And I'm going to let you guys talk about your current projects. Uh, John, you are working on Colorado Riverside projects. So tell well, me it, about it, that. That's so, so that's actually, it's, it's not Riverside, but the, the oh. what they call the Colorado River uh, cooperative CRCA cooperative river agreement and that that's something that's been done that uh, my company Bishop Brogdon uh, played a role in and that was an agreement between Denver water and the West Slope entities on how Denver would import water from the West Slope over to the East Slope because they have a, a very large collection system uh, that brings water uh, from the West Slope to the East Slope uh, Dillon Reservoir gross reservoir and, and a number of different tunnels that convey that water this to this site and so the uh here recently they've they proposed to basically expand that project and nice. take even more water from the west slope in the past it was more of a hey we're just going to do this um and that's what happened uh now you know the there's so many more different players that uh want to have a voice and are you know are concerned with it the the in, environmental impacts of this the economic impacts, uh, kind of the title of today, of what's going to happen when more and more water gets removed out of the upper Colorado. Uh, so we helped um, our clients in the beginning uh, on the West Slope kind of model and see, okay, what's going to happen? What are some of the things that we could say, hey, you need to do this uh, so that we're not as impacted? Uh, the upper Colorado has, and the Fraser Rivers have real uh, problems with uh, the water getting too warm in the summertime because there's not as much flow anymore, and the river's really big. Um, such that they need flow in this late summer to, to keep the fish happy. Yeah. Or the rafters happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's there's many different groups that get in, and, and that was a cooperative agreement, um, you know, collaborative decision-making uh, that they got together and said, how can we do what we want but then help you as well? And that, get, that, that was a, a very long process that, it, it took many years that we were on the West Slope side. And in the end, once they kind of said, hey, here's what we want to do and we need to look at some more stuff, BBA was actually a, a company that both sides agreed to to do further analysis on the hydrology of how this is going to work and, and you know, basically prepared reports for both sides to use and move forward with. And, and that kind of created this learning by doing um, process of where they're kind of using money that's been set forth to do something and see what happens and hey great that either worked or yeah it didn't work if it worked great let's do it again if it didn't work well it did a little bit but we're not going to do that again right so it was, it was a really neat project to kind of see how the all the different sides of the economy the economy people the the fishing guides the raft guides uh, the folk, the environmental folks that, you know, they do also want the fish and the wildlife and the habitat and the, the river to be healthy, kind of getting together and, and having multiple, you know, joint interests hmm. and getting all and putting that together and, you know, using somebody that's going to take water away, but using that 
and using their desire to also help the, the folks on the West Slope. Yeah. It was a very neat process. That is a very neat process. And I'm, I'm always a big fan of collaborative work. Mm -hmm. The name of the show is Connect and Collaborate. Mm -hmm. So it's always fun for me to make sure that there's other collaborative efforts out there, particularly mm -hmm. engineers are very good about being collaborative in general. Just the, the whole profession. It's been my experience so far, at least. <laughs> um, there, and don't get me wrong, there's some competition. <laughs> I'm aware of that, too. <laughs> uh, but Tom, tell me about the Little Thompson River Project. So the, the Little Thompson River Project, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but it's basically um, repairing the stream so that the next flood that happens, uh, the banks are stable, the vegetation is stable, and it allows our clients who are irrigators and industrial users and some municipal use the ability to get water off of the river in high flows and low flows and to not carry the sediment load that's going to be there until you know the vegetation rebuilds itself so that project um, you know it's interesting you, you we're using natural resources we're using large boulders and and um, and rock that are you know four foot diameter and the the contractor can place them like they're pieces of a puzzle so it's interesting to see how um, people that really know how water moves and how they can then use it, we can use it to protect um, the river, we can use it to protect infrastructure that's critical for irrigation. Um, and so that's been a wonderful project. And then another one I'll touch on briefly, we're working at St. Mary's Glacier uh, for that community up there. And there's just, there's a lot of work to do on the water system. It was a leaky water system. And we've been able to help get them some grant monies and some funding so the goal is to rebuild the water system, you know, not the entirety of it, but to bring it on slowly and to help the community with their potable water system. That's awesome. Yeah. Great to hear. Um, so I want to make sure that we talk a little bit more in this last minute here about ACEC Colorado and mm -hmm. how you're associated with them. Again, visit acec-co.org for more information. You can find the show there as well. Um, but your involvement with yeah, it. that uh, I've been part of the ACEC Colorado and their Water Resources uh, Committee mm -hmm. uh, for a number of years now. Um, we have monthly meetings, maybe not every single month of the year, uh, but quite often throughout the year. Um, during those meetings, the the kind of the water uh, coming up on March ninth, ninth, nineteenth, isn't it? Tomorrow. No, uh, 20, oh, no. no uh, 29th. <laughs> 29th. Next Friday. <laughs> Next Friday. <laughs> um, that we're able to get in front of the state engineer, the Division of Water Resources, the CWCB, Colorado Conservation Board, um, and talk about different water issues. Uh, it's a great meeting place. That is and, a great meeting and place. It's, uh, and thank you to ACEC for uh, making that happen and making this happen today, too. It's been yeah. a, been a yeah. lot of fun. And thanks to ACEC. And, you know, the state engineer's office is a great site. Um, the Colorado Groundwater Association, the Colorado Water Well Contractors Association, and then Metro State actually offers a program called One World, One Water. Yes, um, which uh, they are amazing as well. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you in. Uh, have you. a wonderful day. Be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page while you're here. Find this podcast more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. Have a wonderful day, you guys. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Thanks, you too. <laughs>